Thank you for listening to this download of Start the Week, presented by Tom Sutcliffe. Hello. We're sticking with the easy questions this week. What counts as art? Why do good books matter? And how can you make money by giving your product away? This year's Reith Lecturer, the Turner Prize winning artist Grayson Perry, will be tackling the first one in a series of lectures about that fractious borderline between popular taste and high art. Philip Davis, Professor of English Literature at the University of Liverpool, wants to fight a rearguard action on behalf of serious reading, and he fires the first shot with his book Reading and the Reader. And Nicholas Lovell has just published The Curve, a guide for those perplexed about how to succeed in business in a market where the customer increasingly expects to get something for nothing. Also with us, Penelope Curtis, director of Tate Britain, here to talk about the gallery's new exhibition on iconoclasm, art under attack, which documents what happens when the relationship between an audience and an artwork turns violent. Uh, but we're going to start with the Reith Lectures and, and you, Grace and Perry. Um, you've called your Reith Lectures playing to the gallery. Yep. I think they are the first Reith Lectures that I've ever heard where you, the lecturer is whooped to the podium. <laughs> Certainly the first where it begins with style notes on the dress you're wearing. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's a, from the very beginning, a sense of mischief. How important is mischief to your sense of what, what art should be doing? Well, art has often had a kind of current of mischief running through it, going right back to sort of Marcel Duchamp. I think there was a big element of mischief in his famous sort of intervention of, of putting forward a urinal as art. So I think, you know, it's, I think it's one of the most creative forces, humour, because it allows us contact with our kind of um, low impulse control. And that is a good state to be in if you're going to be creative. I mean, you know, there's other things like sex, perhaps, or crime. They're also things that, that where people have lost impulse control. But... Um, I, I think humour is often... I mean, one of the first questions I was asked when I won the Turner Prize was, are you a serious artist or are you a lovable character? And I kind of said, oh, can't I be both? You know, because, you know, there's many artists... I mean, David Strigley, who's up for the Turner Prize this year, he's hilarious. He's a brilliant, you know, humorist yeah, very, as very. well as a good artist. So, But there, but there is, a, there is a, lo a, a long-established connection between humour and frivolity in the sense that it's it's not serious and... Yeah, it's a dangerous like, thing to do, isn't it? Yeah, that's that, well, that's good because you know maybe that's something that needs puncturing because you know seriousness has gone up some awful alleyways in the art world. If you, I mean, in the first lecture, I talk about the language that is used in this attempt to sort of build series, and it's now known as international art English, you know, which is sort of impenetrable gobbledygook that is sort of now used by kind of MA dissertationists. You have a very funny anecdote about the the woman who edited an art magazine and English wasn't her first language and people complained it was unreadable in the wrong way. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> because it was seen as a kind of bastion of supporting this idea of seriousness and its impenetrability and exclusiveness that it defended because there's many kind of things in the art world, I think, where people are scared that if they allow in the masses and they allow people to understand it somehow, that it will stop the art being good. But no, the art is good. It will stand up to the test, I think, on the whole. As, a, as an oik who's managed to crawl his way into the temple, you know, and I still like it, I think that why can't other people do the same journey? Um, that's essentially the ambition of your Reith Lectures, isn't it? To to help other people make that journey. I mean, playing to the gallery, you're, you're, you say at, at the beginning, you know, the, the alternative title you discarded was sucking up to an academic elite. Yeah. Um, you are aiming at a general audience and you want to kind of bring them in. I want to ask the obvious questions that, you know, the man looking at his iPod on the Clapham omnibus um, would ask. And uh, so it's like, how do we tell if anything's any good? How do we tell it's art? Um, where is the cutting edge? And uh, how do I become an artist? You know, that, they're the sort of basic, really obvious questions that I, I want to ask and, um, and have a lot of fun along the way and perhaps make a few, hopefully, serious points. Um, what's your own definition your own personal because you, in the lectures you describe the landscape you describe many of the problems that exist between audiences and works of art and some of the problems with art after Duchamp when anything can be art um, what's your own definition well I give a whole series of tests for people and I my second lecture is called beating the bounds after that sort of ancient ritual of going around the parish boundaries and I take people to various sort of marker posts uh, and so it, 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 some of them are kind of quite serious. You know, is it done by an artist? Is it in an art context? You know, is is this work looking towards the art world in an institutional way? And I also make some more perhaps frivolous ones, like it's often a boring version of something else. 
you know. That's, it, it, <laughs> it's very funny, and I enjoyed that tick list, but it still didn't answer the question for me of what you personally, what what is your definition of a work of art? What How you tell the difference between something? Because you do... Uh, another thing which not a lot of people now do, you do say some things aren't art. What is it that... I put my art goggles on, really, and if it, if, if it disappears, then it's not art. OK. And, but I, and it's a metaphorical <laughs> thing, you know. It, it, it's years of looking at art, and, it, and it, it's not an easy question to ask because I give, all the, I give about seven or eight different tests because it's like a Venn diagram. You know, you can be fairly sure it's art if it's in the middle of all those things. But I think there's a lot of things nowadays that are problematic you know, that are brought in. I mean, I, I use one of the, the examples I use is photography because we have so much photography now. It's just pouring out into our eyes like sort of sewage, constant, you know, unrelenting. And so but some art, some uh, photography is regarded as art. So I give a very simple uh, test, you know, which is, is it over two metres tall? <laughs> is the price tag more than five figures? And is it an addition of five? You know, and these, these are tests I've been given by people talking in the art world. That's a pretty accurate description of when you know it's art. I don't think I'm going to be able to pin you down because that's a kind of evasion, isn't it? That's a way of, <laughs> well, of that's dodging the question. Thing. Ambiguity is one of the central things, you know, because, you know, you're talking about a subjective experience. And if there were easy empirical answers, I mean, in the first uh, lecture, I, I sort of mock the attempts to empiricise quality in art um, because... Uh, it is a subjective thing and, and you have to kind of play it and you have to work at it. But that's the that's the crucial thing, isn't it? The personal experience in yeah. the face of something. You know, I, I don't know what art is, but I know what I like. That's you you want to new... work at it. I mean, I if you ask me to choose the England football team, I'd be useless. You know, and so why do we expect people to be able to walk into a gallery and say, oh, I know what I like? You know, because you've got to work at it a bit. You've got to be, have experience of it. Um, Penelope Curtis, do you have a definition of what is art and what isn't. Yeah, I, mean, but I agree you have to work at it. It takes time. But I, I wanted to ask Grayson, where or what is your art? Because now you're probably more active and maybe you have more impact in, in talking. Yes, but I, I think that art lost its purpose as a mass communication device a long time ago. Are you an artist? Are you? Is your artwork now talking about art? Or not? I mean, it always addresses the art world in some way or another, whether mischievously. You know, I always say that, you know, the art world took a long time to take my art work because it was sort of willfully conservative in some ways. And so, therefore, you know, the art world you know, is, is happy to co-opt something that is definitely not art, like a urine or a shark, into the art world. But something that's on the border, like craft, that's dangerously kind of ambiguous. And you're presumably spending much less time making art now. Um, on and off. I mean, I still put in the hours on my work and I still regard myself as an artist. I still hold my artist licence. <laughs> uh, does, it, does it matter whether the arts are popular? Because that, that's one of the paradoxes you address in these lectures. I mean, you've got Tate Modern, which, uh, you know, on one hand is, is boasting about its visitor numbers and is proud of its visitor numbers. And, th and on the other hand, you have this faint sense that if an, art, if an artwork is too popular, something has gone wrong. Um, which you you address? Yeah, in... my first lecture is called "Democracy Has Bad Taste," uh, and it, and it because you know there is a uh, people talk about a cabal that decides which art ends up, but the cabal does include the public to a certain extent. It's just they're not, you know, a proportionate player in that cabal. And um, you know, pop, if you ask people what are the most popular artworks, quite, sometimes you could be quite surprised. I think in the Tate Modern, the most popular artwork was uh, Matisse's The Snail at one point, which is well, quite... I was, a, I was a bit surprised because you said that art is no longer a, a, a form of mass communication or that that's, that period has passed. Really. And yet, and yet some, some forms of contemporary art are hugely popular, much more popular perhaps yeah, compared than... Compared to the other things we have now, the, you know, the, the, the mass media and the, and the internet, it, they're pygmies, you know. It's, 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 so the other... Uh, roles of art as an asset class is huge as a kind of I think one of the things that I, I want to talk about in it is that art is probably still an arena of experimentation you know it's a place a playground where people can do things that are ambiguous or into intermediate you know in between different media uh, are difficult not necessarily anything to do with you know, uh, politicised in difficult ways so that's what art is good for there's a bit of a connection isn't there Philip Davis to what you're arguing in your book but that art can be a place for thinking i mean you specifically make it about literature but it's a it's a, a space set aside where you can think about things in a different way i love that sense of of art literature being a holding ground a place where as opposed to 
uh, what things are like normally for us. We often don't feel in our element. Um, you start us off asking for abstract definitions of things. But actually, that's very hard to do. And I don't actually like that way of starting. I need to find a situation, a feeling, a human predicament. And art is able to capture that. So uh, Samuel Daniel, Defence of Rhyme, 1603, sets out the idea of the sonnet, because of its rhymes and its structure, as a little world. I love that idea, whether it's sonnets and rhymes or something else, of these little worlds that we can then work within, experiment within, find human feeling within. Do you have a, do you have a sense that it's very different when language isn't involved in, in terms of visual art? No, I don't think so. I was reading of recent uh, experiments in brain imaging, which I'm interested in, where the tingle that is produced by poetry is similar to the tingle that uh, is said uh, in, in relation to music. So I think the idea of uh, the analogies and the sister arts is a good one. Yeah. And I, I was talking to Hans Ulrich Abriest, who's sort of international uber curator and really, you know, someone who does understand where art is going at the moment. Um, and I said, have you got any tips for young students? He said, read poetry. And I was like... <laughs> That's brilliant. I like that. I like refreshingly kind of archaic, but also modern. The good thing about, sorry, about yeah. contemporary art is for a time, it, no one knows what they think. It takes a while. And I, I love, I suppose like Philip, I love experiencing things before people have decided they're good or they're bad. Yes. Um, Nicholas Lovell, does this kind of cross over with your world? Because you, you do a lot of work in the field of com computer games and, and the internet and so on. Yeah, yes, absolutely. For me, the definition of art, which is a very personal one, is does it make me think and does it make me feel? Because non-fiction can make you think. It's hardest for it to make you feel. Um, but I, I kind of need both. Um, other people, as you were talking about, um, uh, visual things can make you uh, feel and think and both. And that's sort of my definition. But more broadly than that, um, I think that the... Um, and games as well. Games can be frivolous. Games can uh, be very emotional. They can give you space in which to think um, and which to feel and for me it's finding a way to allow those uh, those different experiences or different media to drive your emotions and when it comes into the crossing over to what I'm thinking about about what we value um, emotion is an incredibly important part of that it's moving away from valuing physical things because frankly particularly in the western world we have almost every physical thing we need we're way past up that hierarchy of needs um, so the things which we value whether or not that is spending on or spending time on or experiencing or sharing is stuff that attacks our emotions in some form um, I, it, it's a good cue actually to turn to you uh, Penelope Curtis because um, you've just put on at uh, Tate Britain a an exhibition, Art Under Attack, Histories of British Iconoclasm, which is absolutely about the most intense emotion that, that art generates, which is anger, wrath, hatred, <laughs> desire to destroy. It is, but actually often the intense emotion is against something different, and it's art that bears the brunt. So the title is perhaps slightly misleading, because you know in the, a lot of the um, 16th and 17th century, art is attacked because it's showing or um, misleading people about how to worship. It's not that the people yes, hate there's the a art. Yes, there's a theological... Well, it, it's odd, though, isn't it? Uh, um, uh, let's start with, why did you want to put this show on? Because it's a tricky show for an art gallery to... to it is, yes, state. it is a tricky show. It's a kind of taboo subject, but I suppose I think it's part of the history of art, but it's like the underside of the history of art. And because the Tate collection begins in 1540, it pretty much begins just as the Reformation is... Um, you know the dissolution of the monasteries and Henry VIII and then Edward VI even more are allowing the huge wholesale destruction of most of the visual heritage that's in the um, churches and cathedrals of Britain. So 90% yeah. of the wooden sculpture of Britain was destroyed in those years. It's really extraordinary. So what we've lost is amazing. And what we can show in the exhibition, therefore, I guess it's hard. But we've managed to find fragments and things which became talismans, things that were saved, things that were buried to preserve them. So it's it's the it's the kind of the reverse side of the history of art. It's a heartbreaking first room, that, because you do realise, looking round it, how much has gone and how much of, of really great art, too. Yes. Well, I suppose it's hard for us to know how much has gone and what we see very often is that the heads have been removed the hands have been removed it's the particularly important bits of the images that have been removed but I just wanted to come back to you on violence because often the interesting thing about iconoclasm is that it's not violent it's very bureaucratic and sometimes it was done by the civil service and they went round with you know ledgers scoring out the things that they'd taken away and removed and they did it very carefully 
very thoughtfully. So it's actually, in some ways, it's more like what was happening in Nazi Germany. It, it's not violent. It's rarely mindless. It's full of forethought. Yeah. Well, it's care- it's it's carefully organised, isn't it? But it quite often ends with men with crowbars well, smashing there's... windows. There's a terribly uh, interesting mm. picture of men at work destroying the stained glass windows but what in, was... in a cathedral. Those men were probably salaried. That's one of the interesting things. And it was very it was a huge labour. I mean, they had to have hundreds of people to get down some of those sculptures. And huge amounts of wood, the, both the fittings and the sculptures, were burnt to melt the lead. So the, the cathedrals were like huge bonfires in which they were just trying to get the material goods first out of the fabric. And then after that came the actual visual, the iconograph- iconography. Um, I said this is a difficult um, subject for an art gallery to do. Um, the critics have, n- have been pretty iconoclastic about this show. They have come in with sledgehammers themselves, haven't they? You've not had great notices. I just wanted you to address the kind of two main charges. Um, and the first, I suppose, would, would be to say, well, it's a bit of a muddle. You know, you start with religious iconoclasm, then you've got self-destructive art, you've got all sorts of different things going on, political um, yeah, demonstrations. It, yes. it, Why do they all fit together? Um, well, they don't exactly. Um, and I think it's, it's a grey area and it provokes different kinds of thinking. I suppose we thought it would be more interesting to bring it up to the present day because iconoclasm is still with us. It's less politically and less religiously motivated here in Britain but it has become part of um, a way of working and I think the threads that pull the beginning and the end together are the fact that it's still the human face especially which is attacked. It's still the eyes more than anything. So it's, it's the kind of surrogate, the human body is still used as a way of thinking about how to attack something you don't like or you want to undermine. And I think that for example looking at the way the suffragette talks about attacking the rugby Venus and then seeing the Yoko Ono piece in which men are cutting her clothes off her and then thinking about the, the iconoclasm done to the female body. I mean, that is something that you see all the way through the exhibition. Well, that, that brings me on to the second charge, which is one of irresponsibility, because, I mean, specifically about the suffragettes, that yeah. at least one critic said, you know, you have um, provided a, a justification for yeah. an act of vandalism. Well, I, th- I think it, it's a serious subject and I don't think that galleries ought to shy away from things which are serious. Why did you shy away from having Mark Rothko in the show? Because Tate, that's the most famous recent example of art being attacked, and it's not in this show. No. Um, Well, partly because it was attacked after we'd started thinking about the show, but also because, um, two very good reasons, I think, it's not really part of a British history of iconoclasm, and there was no particular reason to talk to target Rothko apart from the fact that it was a famous painting. What we wanted to show in the exhibition was that the art that was attacked there was attacked for a reason and generally it was quite programmatic. But you've you've got other artists who are not um, British artists. Um, You've got Gabriel Metzger who painted with acid and he's in the show. Well, Gustav Metzger's lived in Britain since he was a child and he came here fleeing fleeing the Nazis. Um, He was very, very driven by what had happened to his parents. They were, you know, um, consumed in the Holocaust, you might say. And I think that affected, you know, he was one of the founders of CND. The thinking about what happened to, after World War II and the nuclear threat is a reason, I think, for a lot of the art that was attacked because people th- thought it's a lot, rather like Mary Richardson as a suffragette. Art is not as important as people, and human lives are more important. Um, uh, Grace and Perry, you, um, you make a reference to Tangley and his self destructive art. In mm-hmm. the, uh, you presumably have. Uh, 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 as a potter, uh, a particular notion of the delicacy and the fragility done, of your I mean, art. I did a piece for a couple of shows ago, which I was the uh, the Westfield vase. And so I, I did a part with a map of Westfield shopping centre on it. And then I took it to my restorers and I took, got a big hammer out and I smashed it and had him rebuild it in the traditional Japanese way with gold lacquer mending all the cracks. He had this alternative map almost like a map of desire lines over the top. So I use that process of destruction to kind of make a point, you know, because it's very... I've always loved those uh, restored Japanese ceramics with the gold lacquer lines on them. So, it, there, you know, that's, that's, that's my take on sort of destruction of my own work. Is there, is there not um, an expression of a certain uh, public rage about contemporary art in some of these attacks? Certainly, may, uh, I mean, the Mark Rothko attack was as it were, co-opted into a... Was rather a self-serving... Um, well, that wasn't was, public rage. No, no, it was I mean, claimed It was claimed as yeah. an artwork itself, wasn't it? Which is what very often happens when think, people do... I think the high point of public rage about contemporary art was probably in the 50s and 60s. I, I think now 
people either like it or leave it. Largely. Well, you have you have the Tate um, bricks, don't you? They have, yes. You have the famous Carl Andre the, bricks. The I think a lot of the outrage at art now is just going through the motions. You know, it's like what you're meant to do. You're meant to say my eight-year-old could do that when you go into a gallery. But I don't think a lot of people know. Yeah. It's not a hugely emotional thing. No, it isn't hugely emotional, but it's still interesting, I think, that that icon... I mean, the, the iconoclasm you see in media attacks on contemporary art is very similar to the original theological. It's, That's it's right. a notion... I mean, the, the comedy of those early yes. attempts is we're going to defeat superstition. And it's an expression of superstition to think that this thing has so much power that you have yeah. to attack it. But one of the things the exhibition shows is that very often the iconoclasm starts with the media in the 20th century and then it comes to the art later and it's stirred up by the press. Uh, Nicholas Long. So I wanted to ask about that connection between what you were saying earlier about mischief and humour and poking fun at authority through art and the iconoclasm, which is uh, anger and rage, and in the case of the suffragettes uh, uh, from the exhibition, um, targeting the establishment through the destruction of art and I wonder whether or not as we come into a 21st century which is much more about sharing and much more about individuals and much less about the mass media the mass media is very good at getting wound up about rage people are better at sharing stuff that makes them laugh humour and uh, and if, if a YouTube clip is going to go viral it's because it's funny not because it's angry at well, some time rage works on Twitter quite well doesn't rage it? works on Twitter <laughs> is a good point but I'm just I'm just intrigued by these kind of two sides of the same the same thing which is that if one of the roles of art is to challenge and poke fun and uh, target authority, this um, comedy end, this humour frivolity end. and humour are very end. close. Though. Exactly. I mean, you know, just listen to Bill Hicks. No, know. they absolutely are. <laughs> and some of the best ways of puncturing authority is, I think, using humour. And there's a deep underlying thread of anger running through that. It's just we're allowed to share it and, and embrace it in a way that as a society we tend to reject violence as a, as a mechanism compared to humour. Um, Philip Davis, I want to turn to you now because we're talking about what art can do and, and w what it can generate. Your um, book, Reading and the Reader, is the first of a series, a new series, called The Literary Agenda. It very clearly is uh, a rearguard action, it seems to me. You're saying something is being lost here. I'm gonna, we're going to fight to get it back. What is, what is, in your sense, embattled and why is it worth fighting for? It doesn't feel like a rearguard defence in the sense that... Um, I quite like uh, crises, and clearly there is a crisis in, in terms of funding and uh, maybe uh, value for the arts and for reading. Well, literature specifically, isn't and, it? Yeah. And I like the fact that that makes us go back to justifying in terms of the roots. I've, I've no patience with people being absolutely horrified, the cries of pious indignation that says, oh, we're being challenged, oh, we're being told we're not useful. Well, I think in relation to uh, literature and reading, we should say how we are useful. And I don't feel on the back foot about that. I think it's a terrific no, opportunity. But why, but why do you have to say it now? Why is it necessary after hundreds of years in which literature was, uh, you know, uh, it was a commonplace that literature was central to social values? Why do you feel you have to say it in a book? Well, there are issues about funding, funding of the universities, funding of the arts. There's increased uh, digital media and uh, a lot of talk about how the book uh, is finished. I don't believe that for a moment, but it's part of, of the media hype. And above all, I, I think from my point of view, we live increasingly in a world of paraphrase, of summaries, of forgive me, definitions, where you have to set out in advance, apparently, your agenda. Well, the literary agenda, this series published by Oxford University Press, is trying to say you shouldn't know things in advance and that literature is the way of exploring and triggering thoughts and feelings. And uh, you shouldn't even know necessarily what those feelings are. They can just be that of a sort of excitement. Uh, you have a very nice phrase in the book. Reading intently is like creative writing done the other way round. Yeah. Uh, it, it is for you a creative act, not a passive one. That's right. I think that things are triggered in readers as they are triggered in writers. So when Wordsworth writes of a negligible young woman who has died that the world won't know about, he says, last stanza, she lived unknown and few could know when Lucy ceased to be, but she is in her grave and, oh, the difference to me. The most emotional word there is difference. It doesn't name the emotion at all, but it implodes within the reader so that you remember the difference that it makes between a life and a death 
even though this is not a public occasion. And is what's essential there a certain opacity to coax the reader out? I mean, you're talking about serious reading. You're not talking about flicking through a magazine or taking time out to read, a, say, a beach bestseller. You are you are making a defence here of, as it were, what some people might say is difficult books. No, I'm not in favour of difficulty for difficulty's sake. I'm in favour of a certain sort of richness and density that often can produce a great simplicity. But she is in her grave and, oh, the difference to me. No, but what I mean is that it's not spelled out. That That's th- the there's, skill there's of the still poet. Work. That's the skill of the poet, and it's not a difficult... It's just that he is, you know, in a sly way, is, is, is introducing it in the corner of your eye so that you have the feeling where it's not announced like some X-factor kind of boom-bastic kind of thing that tells you now you are going to emote. You suddenly, suddenly the ground is pulled away from you by this word, and you are... You know, it's heart-stopping. Um, is, is there an analogy with visual art for the same thing? Yeah, definitely. But, because visual art, of, well, op- operates on an even more often uh, subconscious level, you know, and, and the artist has to be sensitive to what his own work is saying and hopefully pass that, you know, message on unconscious. It's, it's without tech, you know, it's, there's no words there usually. You know, you just pass that on and you hope because somebody, they'll walk into the room and they'll instantly either get it or not get it what this work is about sometimes I don't, I don't but when you know. when I you say feel the opposite mm-hmm. i mean i think it's about art that's rich enough to mean different things at different times and to, to want to come back to again and again and that's why i similarly like you i don't like it when people are told that they're going to be inspired or they're going to be, be sad or they're going to you know be made to laugh because people will feel different things and also feel different things at different times what i particularly love is that uh, art can look formal and sophisticated and powerful and well-crafted, and undoubtedly it is. But something that it comes from in the artist and something that it releases in the reader is like grunts. Wow, I don't want to do too many noises on radio, but... That's what we're here for. (laughs) Maybe the first thing. And I love that sense of the vulnerable, the raw, the inarticulate that is released by these formal and beautiful things. Um, it's not just emotion, is it, though? Because you no. also you also uh, write about reading as offering an alternative to philosophy as a way of thinking about ourselves. Yes. Um, which is quite a, quite a directed and careful kind of thinking. Um, does that mean that reading is philosophy light or... It's a different kind of thinking. No, I thought it was philosophy in practice. I thought that it was taking, um, as far as one could, pretty much raw human situations and trying to do thinking within it, where you may have to blend together in a complex mishmash various things that would, in a philosophical system, be separated out. It's richer. Um, I just want to talk about a specific thing you you do in this book. It's a, it's one of its pleasures uh, for me anyway, because I studied English literature and I was taken back to the pleasure of close reading practical criticism, as used to be taught in in all universities. Yes. Now, yes. practical criticism has faded away a little bit uh, due to. Uh, yeah. fashions in academia well you... I'm very sorry it's called close reading I mean that's what they, it's become because it, as if it was something that Mr Magoo did through <laughs> pebble glasses uh, actually it's reading with immersed attention and to me the opposite of that would be reading with inattention sometimes known as uh, cultural studies or literary <laughs> theory <laughs> there is such a thing I will get into trouble for this but there is such a thing as real reading and real readers are those who are in search of Meaning. Um, is uh, the modern world inimical uh, to real reading? Um, the fact that we have distractions on every side, that you, you are never, you know, more than 10 seconds away from a little distraction on your phone, on the internet? Well, I want to be part of, of what we um, no doubt portentously call a reading revolution. And I'm related to the Reed organisation, which takes great literature out into uh, communities, whether they're dementia homes or prisons, or simply in terms of reader development in libraries, in order to establish small communities where things that were private uh, are suddenly shared. And that begins to create small, better worlds. So the small worlds of poem, but the small worlds of people, reading them aloud together and talking about them together, creates the nucleus of better worlds where the private and the public are in new correlation. We, I, think we, I mean, we can choose to have quiet moments, and that's the, <laughs> that's the thing to try and hold on to, and I suppose I still think it, an art gallery can be a great place to have a quiet moment for some close looking, which maybe is 
as difficult as close reading. I, I wanted to ask you about the holding ground, this because mm. you use that phrase a lot, mm. and to a degree it sounded, I suppose it reminded me of um, holding patterns and therefore a place I didn't want to be in. But sometimes does the art escape the holding ground and f find a more definitive destination, or do you, will it always stay in the holding ground? No, I think it's like uh, saturated solutions. Suddenly what crystallises out may be a belief, uh, a recognised thing from the past. I love that uh, sense of things. But the holding ground comes, I suppose, from things like uh, Robert Frost defining poetry as a momentary stay against confusion. Well, like you, I want those places of contemplation where I can think about life. And I cannot do that unless it's triggered for me by a poem, a novel, a short story. Otherwise, I go into default mode and it's not real. Do you think that there's another form <laughs> of close reading that might be a sort of coming out of... You know, we're in the internet age now and people, you know, uh, teenagers, they can do their homework with the television on the background while they're tweeting, you know. Maybe there's just a different style of intense attention going on that isn't the same... You know, because when you talk about the reading, a close reading, you often talk about the different levels of feeling and emotion and knowledge and understanding that's going on. But maybe, because they're, they're all coming from the one thing, where now we live in a multimedia age, maybe there's new sort of poetry going on between, you know, various screens and earphones and all sorts of things. That's optimistic, don't you think? <laughs> I was just being devil's advocate, you know. It, you know. But it, it might be causal. I mean, people might, in the end, be driven to somewhere quieter. Uh, well, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Nicholas Lovell, this is uh, your cue, because this is the world you're in. You're in the world of, um, very often, the world of distractions. And, and digital. Yeah, and digital and, and so on. Um, you've written a book called The Curve, uh, which is about this new world we find ourselves, very much about commerce and, and mm -hmm. what we do in a world where everything is given away free. How do you make a living in that? How do businesses make a living in it? Just explain what the curve is, first okay. of all. So the curve um, started by answering this question, how do we still pay for the creation of art? Because um, art being games, music, literature, uh, uh, visual art, everything. Um, and it started from this idea, for me, that the music industry has been decimated by digital uh, file sharing, uh, a fall of more than $8 billion in annual revenue. What's that in pounds? £5 billion pounds in annual revenue. Um, and so the curve says, start with the fact, the internet does two things really, really well. The first thing is it makes it really easy to share stuff, which is bad if you're used to charge for the stuff which is being shared. But it also makes it really easy to build one-to-one -one relationships with the people who love what you do. And that's the other thing that kind of wasn't possible. Pretty well the whole 20th century was built around solving that problem of distribution, that sharing problem, and that has become much harder to charge for. But it wasn't focused on building relationships between artist and consumer, between business or artist and fan, business and creator. Um, you, you use um, the musician Trent Reznor as a kind of um, epitome of how to do it right. Because yes. he, um, he gave away uh, free a lot of his music, but then he had staged sort of ways of, of getting the fans to pay more if they really wanted to. Exactly. He did that in rebellion against a record company that was charging his fans too much. I did read that and I thought, well, you've just found a different way to do it, haven't you? Well, so yes and no. So his argument was that he, what he rebelled against was that um, fans of Avril, sorry, Avril Ravine's uh, record was sold for 20 Australian dollars and his was sold for 35 when he asked why. He said, because your fans will always buy your stuff. We have to work to get Avril Ravine's fans. So therefore, <laughs> we will charge less. Which is both a bit unfair, but also totally valid because it says, you know what, your fans love you. They want to give you lots of money, only in this case they want to give the record label that works with you lots of money. And so his argument was to say, I want people to know my stuff, I want people to listen to my music, I want to have a context in which the, social, the, the biggest fans can exist, but I also want, in his case, two and a half thousand of my biggest fans to have access to this $300 beautiful product, uh, a physical artefact, because he thinks there is, and I agree, that there is a place for the digital and a place for the physical and the tangible, and they have different values. <laughs> What's the difference in income he may, he would have made if he'd have stuck with the record company to his new thing? Because I have a feeling he made a lot less money from the second, uh, second. Uh, Well, I think it is possible he made a lot less money, and actually my contention is that we're all going to make a lot less money from media in the 21st yeah, century. But that's the subject the I read in a lot of your book, is that we're all going to make a lot less money. <laughs> because this idea of the curve, there's these super fans who pay a premium. 
they're not always the rich people, the super fans, in my experience. No, but, but that's but, okay. but, Yes, but you're in your trade. Yeah. It's, it's only the super fans who buy, isn't it? You're you're at one end of the curve. Any fine artist now. I'd is... like to think that all my collectors are super fans. I mean, my business is is so particular in that it's such a. I you know I have so few clients, you know, in comparison to a musician or an author, that uh, it, 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 it's a very different business. Um, I think that's the but, question, whether the superfans are very rich and therefore whether the very rich come to influence the product. That's what I wondered from reading. So I, th- I, no, I think there is a huge danger uh, around that. But my, my contention is essentially this force is unstoppable. The web has fundamentally changed what was possible. That means that it's not, it's not a whole generation suddenly deciding they don't want to pay for art or, or creation. It's um, a whole bunch of businesses figuring out di- and, and creators figuring out different ways to reach their audience. And there we are. can't fight that. We have to embrace it and embrace the benefits. Uh, you say we can't fight it. A lot of people are going down fighting, aren't they? I mean, only the other day, David Byrne, the musician, mm-hmm. was um, wrote a long article about Spotify saying that it was going to be the death of certain creative forces because you simply cannot make a living under the Spotify model. So um, I, I, David Byrne's article um, in The Guardian was actually surprisingly well-reasoned for some of these uh, people going down fighting. Um, I don't see an issue with fighting that I don't want to be free yet. Um, you know, the curve isn't free at the moment. We have a whole bunch of free things you can download, including a short free ebook. but the physical product still costs a lot of money to create. What I'm saying is that you're heading in the direction of free. Take all the benefits of free, whether or not it's grace in building a website that starts finding an audience who eventually grow into super fans, or if you're a musician or an author, accepting that a whole bunch of people are going to get your stuff for free anyway, and build hooks in which say the end point is you want to be able to talk to those people again directly and as you talk to them directly I do think that uh, to answer your question Grace and that it is possible people will make, make less money but more people will be able to make a living from the creation of their art and there will be less dependence on the gatekeepers who said no you can't have that that's not art the other thing that I, I noticed is you've had this sort of faith in 3D printing becoming you know which you know, the, everything I've seen that a 3D printer has made looks like sort of an anemic fossil yeah. you know like <laughs> something that I would have sort of trampled on on an airfix kit and um, and that, is that a trans- I wonder if it's going to make really does. I mean, I can see certain applications like like you say, parts for old yeah. cars or something like I can see that could work. But in terms of the kind of luxury product that, you know, you might want your super fan to buy. I, I, can't, I mean, 3D but that, but, printers, are, are they really going to do But that's it? your point, isn't it? That you, it's not, that's not what they're going to be paying for. That, exactly. that will put up the price of the handmade, the... So I, I totally accept the charge that the 3D printing uh, chapter in the curve is very much uh, future gazing because we are we are clearly not there. We're in about 1980 in terms of the, the transistor mm-hmm. and what computers can do, and we're at the same point for 3D printing. But um, I, I googled the phrase "overdesigned lemon squeezer" and I get back the Alessi Philip Stark design, Juicy Sally, the three-legged Martian-like thing, which I think is a terrible lemon squeezer. I'm just a bit too short to squeeze lemons on my worktop with it. Um, and for me, the idea that you could take that and adapt it and improve it, make it work better in a dishwasher a different height um, is fascinating and massively just for early adopters at the moment. It makes vastly more sense to manufacture that in China and ship it around the world right now. But if you fast forward 30 years, I'm not convinced that there won't be a place for both, the really expensive and the homemade. Uh, I want to just come quickly back to this. You you talk briefly about um, writers in your book, very briefly, and you have a kind of, you know, idea that a writer might, as it were, market himself by a kind of premium experience. So you could have, you know, the, the, the VS Naipaul, you know, you get the ebook, or you can have the VS Naipaul lunch. Well, VS Naipaul isn't going to do lunch, and that's not what he's about, you know. Um, nor Georgia, <laughs> nor no. Shakespeare. It's a real <laughs> difficulty, I see that. Well, except the dead people don't have to get paid. Um, <laughs> but, but, but the live people, no, I, I agree there was a problem. I saw There's... a link with um, the way art galleries are going, I suppose, in Britain, that it's free for everyone, but there are, in, there are increasing levels of circles of patrons. Absolutely. And when you get to the top, the, you know, the top people have lunch with the director, I suppose. It's, a, it's something the Royal Opera House has done for 300 years, this, isn't it, in a sense? I don't they, have they... The, they have the gods at £30 and they have the stalls yes. at 250 Yes, but what will they need to start figuring out is how to use the free digital end to widen their circle so massively. Is the kind of the way that Obama came to power... Uh, an example of what you're talking about uh, I think I think absolutely those kind of techniques that the absolute heart of it is to go I can build one to one relationships once I have one to one relationships I can figure out what so then you're getting real power to the base rather than real power to the top is that what you're is that the ultimate goal 
I, I, isn't the, uh, uh, there is another <laughs> yes. danger here, though, isn't there as well, which is that if your economy now depends, your, your, your career depends on a model in which you've got ma a mass market, which is free, you have to create something that will attract a large enough free market. And lots of people don't want to do that. They want to create something from the very beginning, which is perhaps for a small group of readers. A, a small group, yes, but at the moment the mass market is measured in the millions or the tens of millions. And I think with digital connectivity and the ability to say, instead of everybody who likes my stuff pays £10, some people pay nothing and some people pay 10000 you can actually make this viable at a much smaller mass market size. But would like the people who pay 10000 have an effect on what happens? what the product is that's what i think it is surely it's going to it's corrupting uh more corrupting than the fact that at the moment it's the mass market lowest common denominator taste which determines what gets made well it isn't um, always is it because it you also always. you also write about the gatekeepers and how essentially they're redundant you know editors uh, publishers editors all of those people choosing what gets through um, they're out of a job too. I, no, I argue that half of their role is redundant. I argue that the gatekeeper role is redundant. They have incredibly important roles in terms of improving the quality of the creation. But the role of simply deciding um, it is too risky to publish this thing, you know what, it's not so risky to publish it anymore. You can just put it out so much more cheaply that it's better to release it and see if it works. OK, I, well, I, I'm sorry. I have to be a gatekeeper now because we've run out of time. I have to slam the gate on you all. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Thank you to, uh, thank you to all of you, uh, to Penelope Curtis, um, the exhibition Art Under Attack, Histories of British Iconoclasm, continues at Tate Britain until the beginning of January. Nicholas Lovell's The Curve, From Freeloaders into Superfans, The Future of Business, is out now. Philip Davis's Reading and the Reader will be published next week. And Grace and Perry's First Wreath Lecture will be broadcast on Radio 4 tomorrow morning at 9. I recommend it. It's very funny. Next week, Stephanie Flanders is here to discuss the thorny issues of immigration and neutrality with Paul Collier, Kwasi Kwarteng, Nick Young and Lindsay Hilsom. But for now, thank you and goodbye. There's more information about Start the Week on the programme's website. Go to bbc.co.uk where you'll also find many more Radio 4 programmes you can download for free.